Good morning and thank you for joining us for our online service from Unity Baptist Church in Champaign, Illinois. Uh, we are located at 404 South Duncan Road in Champaign. Uh, we're just south of Springfield Avenue, behind the Carpenters Union, and kind of caddy cornered from Prairie Gardens, which is a pretty well-known establishment in our area. We'd love for you to come and join us in our in-person service, which also begins at 1015 every Sunday morning. We would love to have you. Love to meet you and love to have you meet our people. Uh, we're looking once again in the book of Daniel. Uh, we're in chapter six. We're gonna be talking uh, today and looking at, at verses 14 through 28, which will take us through the rest of the chapter. Uh, we have not uh, dealt with the prophecies of Daniel. That, that has been on purpose. Uh, we have chosen instead to focus on his life, uh, the various incidents in his life that have given us insight into his character. And as I've said before, what, what enabled him? This Jewish boy started out at 17 years old when he was taken into captivity. A young man who had grown up no doubt, uh, in, to, in some degree of luxury, having been a part of the royal family of Judah. And he's taken into captivity, and yet we find that Daniel, not only as a 17-year-old, but also throughout the rest of his life in Jewish tradition, says that he lived to be over 100 years old, that this man has been able to... Uh, what I call walk the tightrope of being in the world but not of it and being involved in, in the political atmosphere of one of the greatest empires the world has, world has ever known. It was a pagan empire and one of the greatest of all time and yet this young man managed to involve himself in that and yet stay unique from that. How did he do that? And that's been the subject that we've talked about today in verses 14 through 28 of, of chapter 28. There's another aspect that I want to spend just a few minutes talking about today, and that is recognizing the lion tamer. And I, I think you'll get the idea of what I'm talking about here as we go through this today. You know, the great stories of the Bible, and we'll read this in just a minute, are not, are not given to us for our entertainment. God did not have the authors of these various books write down these stories so we'd have something to read to our kids before they went to bed at night. That, that's not the purpose of these what, at, at, at all. In fact, Paul says in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 11, and he's speaking specifically there of the children of Israel in the wilderness, but, but it, it applies to all of the Old Testament and the stories of the Bible. He said, these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. In other words, God wrote down these stories about David and Moses and Jacob and Abraham and Joseph and all of these stories that we find in the Old Testament. He wrote them down for us to teach us something. You know, he's not trying to dazzle us with tales of daring do, you know, where, uh, we are, are not reading them to that end. That's not the purpose God gave them. They are teaching tools. True stories, but they are teaching tools for us in developing our own relationship with the Lord. They allow us, uh, by reading these stories and, and seeing what these great men and women of faith have done in the past, we see the character of God displayed in, in the real life circumstances they faced as they followed him faithfully. That's why God wrote these things down. He wants to teach us something. 
uh, primarily he wants us to teach wants to teach us something about himself and though these true stories uh uh, are are important they through them we're able to see God's faithfulness we're able to see God's watch care over us his love we're able to see his benevolence his power his goodness that uh, are a part of his character and not only those things but multiplied other aspects of the character of God and somebody might say, well, why, why would the Lord do that? Well, I think why he did it is pretty obvious because the Lord wants to be known. Now, that may seem uh, amazing to us, but it's nonetheless true. God desires to be known. He's not up in, in space somewhere hiding from us so that we can't find out who he is. Quite the contrary, God desires to be known, and he wants you and he wants me to know him. That's an underlying uh, message throughout the scriptures. And one of the ways that God reveals himself to us, he reveals himself in his creation, he, he reveals himself uh, in, uh, through the word of God. God makes himself known to us. Now, the mistake we often make in reading these stories is that we make them about us. Uh, and, and we miss the point that God is trying to make. The most obvious of these stories where we make them about us is the story of David and Goliath, uh, where we make it about us facing our giants and, and we draw that lesson from that story. You know, uh, Goliath is our giant that we have to face, and we're David, uh, little David down here with the five smooth stones and the slingshot, and it's about, we make it about what we have to do to fell our giants. That's not what that story's about. I mean, that may be an application. We may be able to apply it, but if you really want, want to know what it is about, uh, God is in control of all things and, and he is uh, overcoming. David did not overcome the giant. God overcame the giant. And, and that's the real thing. What we often do, and I'm as guilty as anybody else, what we often do is miss the point God is trying to make. You know, we read these stories in the Bible. We read, for instance, the story about, about Esther. Well, who's the heroine in the book of Esther? Well, everybody says, well, Esther is. Or somebody else might say, well, her, her cousin Mordecai is really the champion here in this. That's not the story. Esther is the only book in the Bible where God himself is never mentioned. He's never even alluded to. And yet God is, is found throughout the book. And, and he sovereignly works and he places people where he wants. That's what God wants us to know. And it's what he wants us to get out of these things. Is there something, when I read the Bible, is there something or someone that we should be looking for in that story? How is God revealing himself to us through his word? When I read about David, what is God telling me about himself through the story of David? What is God telling me about himself through the story of Esther or Jacob or Joseph or Abraham or whoever else it may be? A good rule of Bible study is to constantly be on the lookout for the work of God in and through the lives of the characters that the Bible highlights because God works through his people to make himself known in a fallen world. And my point is that, that we are sometimes so enthralled with the human elements of the Bible story that we overlook the hand of God in it all. We don't even see God in it. 
And yet that's the whole purpose of the story. He is always at work. And we should do well, I think, to recognize that fact, that, that God is always at work around us. He was in David's life. He was in Daniel's life. He is always at work. Uh, placing us and others in positions where he can accomplish his eternal purposes through our lives. We need to recognize this. And he has given us his word to exalt himself in our eyes. He has given us his word to help us trust him in the most dangerous circumstances we find ourselves in. That is the story of Abraham and of Job and of Jacob and of Esther, and, and we could go on and on. Or he has given us his word to uh, help us to rejoice in his grace and his goodness when we bask in the sunshine of his benevolent nature. And we see that in, jo <coughs> in Joseph and in David and, and in Mary. Oftentimes, we don't recognize the hand of God in our life. We don't see it. And, and one of the reasons we don't see it is because we're not looking for it. And sometimes maybe down the road a little bit, we will stop and think and give it some consideration. And maybe sometime after it has taken place and God has moved in our life and accomplished something really miraculous in our lives, uh, we look back and we say, wow, that was the Lord's doing. God did that. God was working in my life to accomplish his eternal purposes, but also to accomplish his purposes in my own life. Every person listening to me today needs to know that God saved you, saved me, for the purpose of of your life bringing glory to himself and that he is working in your life and in mine at this very moment to bring that purpose to pass through you. God wants to glorify himself through you and through your circumstances and through the difficulties that you pass through as you follow him and obey him. He wants to glorify himself through you. Uh, none of us know exactly how he will accomplish that in our life. It may be through difficulty and hardship. It might be through blessing and advancement, but God's purpose in all that he allows in our life is for his glory. Daniel had certainly come to understand this principle of spiritual life which played a vital role in enabling him to walk this tightrope of righteousness in a very unrighteous world. Uh, how he could be in it but not of it, how he could be deeply involved with it and yet remain unique from it. That's what Daniel did, and that's what I see from his life. In chapter six, we see him nearing the end of his life. He's got to be somewhere around the age of 90. Jewish tradition says that he lived to be over 100. But Cyrus has apparently reigned in Persia long enough that he had gained great respect and, and great admiration for Daniel. Uh, Cyrus lived nine years uh, as, as the ruler of Persia after uh, Persia conquered Babylon. And, and in the mix of all of that is this man, Daniel, an old bureaucrat, a prophet of God, a man of tremendous character and determination to live faithfully before the Lord, whatever the cost was to him personally. But we know that also during that time frame, 539 to 530 BC, Daniel also gained, he gained the admiration of the king, but we know that he also gained the jealousy and resentment of the other satraps and the other governors who decided he had to get 
they had to get rid of him. And so they, they made up this scheme to trap him and, and bring him upon him the, the really harsh judgment of King Cyrus, tricking the king into signing an edict that would punish anybody who would dare to pray to any other person or any other God other than the king for 30 days. And if they did, if they did that, they would be thrown into the den of lions. Well, Daniel, understanding this, we, we talked about this last week, he understood what they were up to. He understood that the king had signed the decree and he had to make a decision. Remember back in chapter one and verse number eight, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. He had to make a decision at that point as a 17 year old young man. And now he's 90 plus years old. He's at the end of his life. He has to make another decision. The king has said, I can't pray to my God. The king has said that if I pray to anybody other than him for 30 days, whether it be God or man, I'm gonna be thrown into the lion's den. And so Daniel had to make a choice. What's he going to do? Is he going to obey the king's edict or is he going to obey God? Daniel chose to obey God rather than men. And he was fully aware of the punishment that he might receive in the doing of that. He chose to obey because of the excellent spirit that was in him. And we talked about that last week. And that excellent spirit referred to the domination of his spiritual life over anything else, over the, the uh, position that he held in the Persian or the Babylonian empire. Didn't make any difference to him. He was going to obey God rather than men, and he was going to uh, to honor God above men. Uh, and that excellent spirit thing talked about the idea of of him thinking of himself as a as a spiritual being who possessed a body, instead of him thinking of himself as a physical being who had a spirit. This gave Dan Daniel an eternal perspective on every aspect of his life. Daniel thought of his life from an eternal perspective. He thought about it in the long term of his life and it enabled him to embrace the ultimate reward of faithfulness to the Lord rather than crumbling in this particular situation under the immediate weight of fearfulness. He, he had a choice. If I do this, if I honor the Lord with my life, it may cost me my life. I may lose my life in a very unpleasant way. I can choose to do this and run that risk, or I can keep myself safe by obeying the king's command. Daniel chose the long term. One of these days he's going to stand before the Lord and he's going to give an account of his life. And, and this is a point at which he has to choose between the Lord or between men. All of us come to those points in our life. If you haven't now, you will at some point in your life. We all come to those places where we have to decide one way or the other. So Daniel decides to follow the Lord. And when the king realized that he had been duped by these governors and satraps, these provincial leaders, and that he had accidentally put Daniel's life in danger, and he loved Daniel, obviously he did. He respected him highly, valued his advice and his opinion. And now these governors and provincial leaders had fooled him into signing this document when he realized that his friend, his confidant, Daniel, 
was put in jeopardy because of this, the Bible says he was greatly distressed and he tried to find a way that he might be able to rescue him, but he couldn't. The other governors and, and satraps pressed the king to do his duty. Keep your word, king. Abide by the law of the Medes and Persians. And the laws, law of the Medes and Persians was that once a law was signed by the king, it could not be retracted. Put Daniel in the den of lions. From a political standpoint, Cyrus had no choice. From a spiritual standpoint, neither did Daniel. This is kind of a, a, a biblical example of the immu uh, immovable object meeting the irresistible force. Something has got to give here. The king can't do anything about this situation. Daniel won't do anything about the situation because he is going to honor his God. He's going to obey and Cyrus could not revoke the edict. I wonder sometimes in my own life, how, how committed am I to obeying what God has told me to do? And how about you? How committed are you to doing what God has told you to do? However uh, small or, or seemingly irrelevant or insignificant it may seem from our standpoint. How committed am I to doing what God has told me to do? I can hear people saying, uh, you know, trying to persuade Daniel, you know, and, and saying to him, you know, prayer, Daniel? Really? Close the window and do it privately. If you close the window and do it privately, nobody on the outside is going to know. And you can carry on this, this daily devotion that you have. Uh, you don't have to do it the same way you've always done it. If the government told you and me that we could no longer meet together, would you meet? Would you go to your church? Would you sit down in the pew and sing the songs and hear the sermon and pray to your God? If, if we were uh, told we could no longer pray in public, would you pray? If radicals began picketing outside of uh, your building, of your church or, or our building here, threatening us as, as we came to the door from the parking lot, would you come to church to worship the Lord? You say, well, this is America. This is never going to happen here. Oh, really? It could. To me, this is one of the great lessons from the book of Daniel, the commitment of Daniel and his friends to obey God's word, to, to pray, and to live out the faith they professed in spite of the consequences. Daniel knew when he opened his window toward Jerusalem and he knelt down and began to pray, Daniel knew what the consequences could be. And he did it anyway. Why? Because he was devoted to obedience to his God. So there are some things Daniel knew going into this situation, I think, that can help us understand how he was able to walk this tightrope of faithfulness to the Lord in the face of government harassment and cultural hatred. And I think we need to learn them and we need, we need to uh, implement them in our life. I want to uh, start at verse number uh 14 says, as soon as the king <laughs> heard this, he was very displeased and he set his mind on rescuing Daniel <clears throat> and made every effort until sundown to deliver him. 
Then these men went together to the king and said, you know, your majesty, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no edict or ordinance the king establishes can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, I want you to notice this. This is Cyrus. This is the, the pagan king of Persia. This is what he thought of this man, Daniel. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles, so that uh, nothing in regard to Daniel could be changed. And then the king, king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought on him or brought to him, and he could not sleep. He goes on, it says, at first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. And when he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God, the king said, has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue from the lions? Then Daniel spoke with the king. May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions and they haven't harmed me, for I was found innocent before him. And also before you, your majesty, I have done no harm. First thing I want you uh, to see here is that Daniel recognized that the Lord surrounds every circumstance of a believer's life. As I look at this passage this week and I, as I was preparing for this message, it occurred to me that it is saturated with the understanding of the Lord's presence everywhere in it from beginning to end. Cyrus recognized it. Cyrus even knew that unless the Lord intervened, Daniel was a dead man. He knew that. And by his own pride, Cyrus had stripped himself of any power to help Daniel. And Daniel's fellow bureaucrats didn't want to help him out at all. And, and there was certainly nothing that a 90-year-old man was going to do to fend off hungry lions. So unless God intervened in this situation, Daniel was a dead man. And he was in that, what we would call a horrible situation where the only help he had was God. You, you've probably been in such a circumstance where you kind of cried out in desperation, you know, all I have is God. Well, you know, if, if all you have is God, that's pretty much all you need. But something that Daniel has learned over the years of his captivity was that his life was safely in the hands of the God he served. He had seen the truth of that statement. Daniel's life was safely in the grip of the God that he served. Nothing was going to happen to Daniel that was not something that would ultimately bring glory to God, which was the point of Daniel's life. And the same is true with us. I don't care what our circumstance is. Nothing is going to happen to us that is, is outside of God's plan for us to bring glory and praise to him. You say, well, what about those people who, who are, are killed or punished or imprisoned? I'm talking about them too. And there are multiplied stories of of people who have suffered in a variety of ways for their faith in Christ, who count it all joy to be able to do that because ultimately it brings glory to God. I'm not sure that as Americans who have spent their life worshiping and serving in a relatively free atmosphere where 
where we don't go to church expecting any punishment. We don't go uh, fellowship with people expecting the government to come down on us. We don't, we don't pray with the idea that it might get us in trouble. I'm not sure we understand that. We have seen at least five times in Daniel, the book of Daniel, when his life was placed in danger because of his faithfulness to God. And yet Daniel had learned his responsibility was not to worry about his physical life, but rather to obey the Lord and trust him with the consequences. That would be a good lesson for us to learn. Certainly be a good lesson for me to learn. When the Lord told us that he would never leave us or forsake us, what do you think he meant? Do we really believe him? It, is it because we do not, do not believe him that we back down from our commitment to Christ in the face of any threat, any discomfort, any inconvenience. I know we'll never face the threat of a lion's den. I understand that. We're never going to have to, to face a giant. We'll probably never face the flames of a raging fire because of our faith, but, but each of us will face our own circumstance that is going to try our faith. And if in that circumstance, the focus, my focus, in the middle of that circumstance, if my focus is my life, whether my life is going to be saved, if that becomes my focus, then I'm going to fold when I think my life is threatened. I'll back down, I'll back off. I have learned in the various circumstances I've faced, if I have learned this, to commit my life to him, if you have learned that in the various circumstances that God has allowed you to go through, then I can face any trial because I know that its outcome is in his hands and that it is ultimately for my good and for the advancement of the gospel. Daniel recognized that the Lord surrounded every circumstance of his life. He'd seen it. He'd witnessed it. He had experienced it in his own life. Second thing I want us to notice in this story is that Daniel recognized that the Lord's preeminence was of greater importance than Daniel's personal safety. It's, it's more important to Daniel what, what people see of God than what they see of him. One of the many things there are to admire about Daniel is that he was not a chameleon. Have you ever dealt with chameleons? Have you ever dealt with people who are one thing to your face and something else behind your back? Daniel was no chameleon. He didn't adjust his life to the whims of the person who sat in the seat of power. He didn't adjust his life to the threats of the people that were around him. He was who he was. Now you could take that or, or leave it. And his commitment to the Lord was what it was. And he was not going to change that commitment uh, according to the political winds. This is the at least the fourth king that Daniel has, has dealt with. He dealt with Nebuchadnezzar, with Belshazzar, with Cyrus, with the king of Judea. There may have been some others in between that the Bible doesn't mention. There, there was nothing that was going to make Daniel change in his commitment to the Lord. Nor should there be for you and me. There was nothing done by Daniel that brought about his deliverance from the lions. Apart from 
his continuing obedience to the Lord and trusting the Lord to do what was best for him and for his own purposes. Daniel's part in this whole story was his faithfulness to the Lord. If, you, if we're going to admire Daniel, which we do and we should, but if we're going to admire Daniel, then we must do it according to his faithfulness to the Lord. After that, everything was out of his hands. He couldn't control his enemies. They wanted him dead. He couldn't control his king who signed the edict to bring it to pass. He couldn't control the lions. What he did have a say in was his faithfulness to the Lord. What he did have a say in was his confidence that the Lord would bring with, uh, be with him to the conclusion uh, of his desired end in this matter. This, in Daniel's mind, is out of my control. This is in the hands of the God that I serve. I'm going to leave it there. He will bring out of this what is going to be to his glory and ultimately to the advancement of the gospel. Somebody says, did Daniel think he was going to die? I think he probably did think he was going to die. Was he afraid? I think he probably was afraid. Uh, you know, nobody relishes the prospect of, uh, of being gnawed to death by a bunch of lions. I mean, these aren't uh, anything but human beings. Was there fear involved in this? There probably was, but the commitment that he had to Christ was greater than the fear that he had for his physical well-being. So what kept him from backtracking on his prayer life in this particular instance? Because Daniel knew, and I think this is an important point, Daniel knew that this was not about him. It was about the God that he served. And, and what I want us to notice here is that, that Daniel did absolutely nothing in the lion's den, but endure for the night. That's all he did. You say, well, do you not think Daniel's a hero in this? No, I really don't. Not as we look at heroes. Daniel's, the heroism of Daniel was his faithfulness to the Lord. He just kept trusting God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to keep my devotion to the Lord. If that costs me time in the lion's den, then so be it. I will probably die and, and it'll all be over. But I'm not going to back off of my commitment to Christ because it might cost me my life. And so I will go into the lion's den and, and probably be eaten up but I'm going there and I'm going to trust God to do in that situation what he wants to do and what he wants to accomplish. And we still make him the hero of the lion's den, but I want to tell you, if, if Daniel were here with us today, he would have none of it because he knew that God was at work in that den of lions and gave testimony to that fact. I think we too often make ourselves the central character of our distressful situation. We're too quick to grab the trophy of triumph. Oh, I made it through the lion's den. We're too quick to acknowledge the cheers of the crowd as we get out of that situation and we hear the applause of the, of the people. You made it through that situation. We're too quick to accept the mantle of hero when all we ever really did was hang on while God worked in our situation. We see in Daniel the same kind of faithful attitude that existed in the three Hebrew children when they told Nebuchadnezzar that if their God wanted to, he could deliver them from the burning fiery furnace. But if not, they said, O king, you need to know that we will not bow to your image. We will not worship 
your idol. They, they wanted Nebuchadnezzar to understand that whatever he did to them was irrelevant because their devotion was to their God. Is that our attitude in the difficult circumstances that we face? Are we just giving God a chance to deliver us? Is that all that we're doing? Is, is our concern how God might be glorified in that through the suffering perhaps that we do or through some other aspect of this difficulty that we have to go through in our life? Or is it set only on, on our, our, our mind is only set on how we might be delivered from hurt or pain or inconvenience or hardship or death. Lord, deliver me. Why? Because I don't want to suffer. Deliver me because I don't want to, uh, to be inconvenienced. I don't want to go through hardship. Lord, deliver me. And if he doesn't, then we're irritated by that because it's God's responsibility in our thinking to deliver us from those situations. Sometimes he does not. Sometimes he doesn't. And the reason he doesn't is for his own glory and for his own purposes. Even Cyrus knew what the issue was. Cyrus said uh, to Daniel, may your God whom you continually serve rescue you. What's he saying? Daniel, this is about your God. It's not about me. I made a mistake. It's not about these jerks over here who wanted to kill you. This is about your God. Is, is your God powerful enough to overcome the, the plans and the wickedness of men? Is our concern that God might be glorified? After a sleepless night, Cyrus comes back to the den and he cries out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue from the lions? He knew what the issue was. That's a key question, isn't it? In our, in our difficulty, in our hardship, is your God able to rescue you? Well, somebody says, well, yeah, he can rescue me and get me out of this mess. But what if he doesn't? Is God able to accomplish in that circumstance what he wants to accomplish? Whatever it means for us, does he have that power? Do we even recognize his work in the circumstances of our life? Do we give him recognition? Do we give him praise? Do we give him glory for doing in, through, and for us what we cannot do for ourselves? Daniel acknowledges, King, my God is the lion tamer. He closed the mouths of these lions. He is the one who has delivered me. He is the one who was ruled and overruled in this situation. Daniel knew that. So did the king. And God was glorified as a result. And then finally, in verses 25 through 27, we don't have time to read it. But if the point of our redemption is to bring praise and glory to the Lord, which Ephesians 1 says that it is, and if that praise and glory is demonstrated before the world by our conformity to the image of God, which the New Testament says that it is, and that conformity is refined by the difficulties we face in this life so that the unsaved world can recognize Christ in us, then let Christ shine forth in every difficulty of our life. That's what Daniel did. He's not sitting over in a corner, chewing his nails, sucking his thumb, and, and saying, boy, I hope I get out of this alive. His confidence is in God. Whatever our circumstance, God is working for his glory and our good. Martin Luther once said, this is true faith a living confidence in the goodness of God. 
Daniel demonstrated a true faith in that lion's den. And whatever your situation is today, I pray that you will demonstrate the same confidence, the same faith in the God that you worship in the good times, that you will, you will demonstrate that same kind of confidence and faith in this God who loved you and gave himself for you in the bad times, that he might be glorified and that you might become more like Christ. Father, I pray that you'll bless this lesson today. To our hearts, help us to understand that you are the lion tamer. You are the one that in our circumstances are to receive the glory. I pray that we will live and work to that end. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.